From the KSL Broadcast House, this is Sunday Edition with Doug Wright. And good morning and welcome to Sunday Edition. The midterm elections are just 30 days away now and debates have already begun. This week, the Utah Debate Commission started its series of five debates ahead of the midterm elections. And as the clock to the election winds down, the attack ads and mudslinging are really heating up. What Evan McMullen says, that doesn't feel kind. Mike Lee, it's time to say no to him. Political action committees are looking to boost their preferred candidate, resorting to attack ads like those you just saw, hoping to sway your vote. But there's a new project that is hoping to help Utahns get to know the real candidates. The project is simply called the Dignity Index. It's trying to incentivize candidates to use more dignity and less contempt. We're going to dig into the Dignity Index today on this show and see how it played out in Thursday's third congressional district debate, as well as look at the scoring of some of what the candidates have said so far in the campaign. But first, a bit of background on the project. The Dignity Index has been in the works for nearly two years. It will examine messages from Utah's candidates running for U.S. House and Senate this election cycle. A group of coders trained by the University of Utah's Gardner Policy and Hinckley Institute of Politics will score portions of the candidates' speeches, debates, social media posts, and campaign ads and put them on a scale from one to eight. The lowest score means the messaging used violent words and treated the other side like they are less than human. Eight is the highest, meaning the language offered dignity and refused to condemn or hate anyone. Those behind the national effort are thrilled that Utah gets to be the testing ground for this project. We have a history of being able to do that, to come together, have these collaborative partnerships. So the closer we got to identifying where this could possibly um, take place, a demonstration project, it just made more and more sense to happen in Utah. I thought it was a really interesting idea, um, certainly, you know, much needed. Uh, and the, the question is, you know, is contempt just in the eye of the beholder or can we actually get people to agree? The Dignity Index scores will be published each Friday through the election and we'll be bringing to you each week those results and have a discussion about them right here on Sunday edition. Now coming up next on the show this morning, we'll be sitting down with some of the very leaders and developers of the Dignity Index. The Utah Project lead, Tammy Pfeiffer, will be with us, along with Dr. Jesse Graham, who is the George S. Eccles Chair in Business Ethics at the University of Utah. We'll be right back with them on Sunday edition. And welcome back. This week on Sunday Edition, we're diving into a new project being tested right here in Utah called the Dignity Index. It's a pilot program that rates public messages from Utah's federal, Senate, and House races on a dignity scale. And here to talk about the Dignity Index more in depth is Utah Project Leader Tammy Pfeiffer and Dr. Jesse Graham, uh, George S. Eccles Chair in Business Ethics at the University of Utah. And to both of you, thank you so much. And Tammy, it's good to have us. you yeah, back on the program. Thank you for having us. So back. nice to meet Great you to meet today, you. Jesse. And I've, I've just got some fundamental questions. We've given a little brief overview, but where did the idea actually come from? Where did it percolate up from? So Doug, um, when I left the governor's office uh, at the end of his term, we, uh, I began working with a group called Unite, and we had been working for almost two years now, a little over two years, on finding ways to ease division in the country. And there are a lot of groups doing these, uh, this type of work. Braver Angels, for example, has chapters all over the country. But we, we looked at what's causing the division and everyone has their theory and, and um, direction to go to solve the division. Mm -hmm. We honed in on, on contempt. Uh, we have divisions that are not caused by disagreement. They're not caused because we think differently. They're, they're caused because we have contempt for each other and have contempt for people that think differently than we do. And so the idea came to define contempt 
and, and what, to find the antidote to contempt, which is dignity, and then find a way to measure the language that we use around contempt and dignity. And that's, why, that's the genesis for this project. As I have expressed concern over now quite a few years, but particularly in the last six or seven years about the tone that I've been hearing, it really does seem that at least in my lifetime, during my political awareness lifetime, that I have, I have never, I think I can safely say I've never seen it worse. I've certainly seen spikes and I've seen things and people like John Meacham and so on remind us mm -hmm. that, you know, this isn't necessarily anything new. We had some real rough times in the 1930s, a civil war, of course, and then, you know, going back to even the very beginning and some of the tone that was there in the Jefferson Adams yeah. election, which was just off the charts. But in my recollection, in my memory, I've never seen it worse. And again, you mentioned the word contempt, and Jesse, maybe you can chime in on this. What are some of the other factors? Why is it bubbling up now? Is it the media's fault? Is it social media's fault? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of places you could you could look to for this is this is why it's gotten so bad. I think it is absolutely exacerbated by social media. Um, the more we're communicating with each other when we're not face to face, right. I think the more free we feel to be contemptuous of another person. Um, you know, if we're you know, flaming people that we've never met um, and will never see in person. I think that makes it worse. Um, and it's a it's a reciprocal thing. I mean, the, the the more that both sides are contemptuous of the other, then it sort of feels like, well, you were just contemptuous of me, so fair's fair. Now I'm going to be contemptuous of you. And then it's just you know, it's just kind of this never-ending cycle that that we're trying to stop. You hit on, on a real key issue, uh, and it was even this way when I was doing my regular radio program daily for so many years. It was a lot easier to beat up on somebody when they weren't sitting across the table from you. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and boy, I'll tell you, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I can quite go as far as Will Rogers and say I never met somebody that I didn't like, <laughs> but you know, when you meet somebody in person and you kind of shake hands or look in their eyes, it's a lot harder to have this kind of contempt or call somebody a name. However, that's become quite an art form even in person in our uh, society today and within our political environment as well. Everything we tell our kids not to do, you know, they John, do. And that's where it really struck me when I was working in education with the governor's office, was that some of the language used by adults uh, in public discourse, political discourse in particular, we would never tolerate that in the halls of our schools. Right. There right. would be an intervention, right? We would pull kids aside. And yet the examples that they're looking to uh, in, in the public, and especially in politics, are sometimes they're not very good examples. Yeah. One thing that I think particularly troubled me, because we've seen little eruptions here and there, and we've seen things happen in the political environment that have literally sunk a candidate just like that, they're gone. Whether it's Gary Hart or even George Romney for being candid one moment and say that he was brainwashed over the Vietnam War. Those things just took you out of the game. Any kind of sexual scandal or whatever. And now it seems, I don't know what it does take to get you out of the game yeah. nowadays. And I think that really points to one of the big sources of the problem is what is the incentive structure? What, what are the candidates incentivized to do, and if now you know, it, it used to be that candidates would be incentivized to be civil because it was seen as outside the pale to, to say something uncivil, and now if they are incentivized to you know make their base happy by saying saying something outlandish, saying something you know contemptuous of the other side, then they'll continue to do that. So part of what we're trying to do with the dignity index is just get some kind of incentive to actually be civil with each other. And part of that incentive really is us. Yeah. You know that's who they're appealing to is us. So if we want to change the discourse of our elected officials, then we need to stop rewarding that behavior. And that, as Jesse pointed out, is something that we're hoping that the index does, is allow people to see what that language looks like. Sometimes when you see it in writing and you have a score attached to it, you're going, um, I don't know, I didn't know I was part of that. Right. I didn't realize I speak like that sometimes, and so a lot of it is this awareness. Sometimes when you're just hearing stuff, it does tend to go in one ear and out the other. I know years ago we were talking about uh, lyrics and songs. You stop and you read them out <laughs> loud, <laughs> and wow, and some of it, 
you know, at least back in the old days, you couldn't have read on the air and not had a filing from the FCC. Mm -hmm. But yet it was, it was out there all the time. We've become a little desensitized, I think, to it. it. And it's just part of the normal. We get into our groups or our own tribes and rail on a particular candidate, and they're so awful. And we, we talk like that amongst ourselves. Yeah. And so this index is a way to kind of shift that lens back on ourselves. Sometimes you'd kind of hear it in the hinterlands, or you'd hear it in a particularly hot congressional race you know, somewhere. Uh, back in the day when you could kind of be protected by geography, you'd hear a particular candidate say something maybe down in southern Utah that they wouldn't say along the Wasatch right. Front. But what I've noticed is it's filtered up. And, uh, you know, with, without mentioning names, but at the highest levels of government, this stuff has always gone on. But when all of a sudden it is made okay, I, I hate to even use that term because it's not okay, but maybe it's codified. It's, mm -hmm. it's brought into the lexicon by the highest levels of government that would have been unfathomable just 20 years ago. Yeah. And how is, how is that sinking into maybe our kids and our society and our dialogue and our campaigns? Yeah, I, I worry about that with my kids, just you know, watching the national news uh, in front of them. I always think, gosh, is that, you know, are, are, they, are they hearing this stuff and thinking that it's okay? Um, you know, and, and some of the rhetoric is dehumanizing. You know, it's, it's, it's seeing the other side as not just people you disagree with, not just people that maybe you uh, think are incompetent or aren't doing a good job, but people who are less than human and people who are an existential threat and must be destroyed. I mean, that's how bad the, the rhetoric is getting. Well, when people who have studied history and you look at the dehumanizing of individuals and what that can lead to, it, it absolutely sends a shudder up my back. Before we uh, take a brief break here and then come back and maybe look at a little bit of the dialogue we're already seeing in debates and so on and get your thoughts on it, why is, it, obviously it had roots here in Utah, but what is expected as people around the country look at Utah and our test of the dignity index? So there are a couple of components and, and Jesse will tell us more about the science behind it. But using Utah as our demonstration project site uh, is helpful because we have certain relationships in place between uh, you know, the media and government and different, the Chamber of Commerce and business groups that we have a history of working together. Mm -hmm. And so bringing this idea into a place with people that work together, um, I think it helps get us off on the right start. At, at least if, if it's to, to fail, it will fail with people trying really hard, and I don't think it will. And if it's to succeed, it will be because of the partnerships that we have in place to test it. And then, of course, our, our great partnership with the University of Utah. Absolutely. We look forward to more conversation on that, plus looking into some of the rhetoric we have already heard, mm -hmm. some of the mailers that have already, or emails that have already gone out, and we'll be right back with more in-depth coverage of the Dignity Index here on Sunday edition. And thank you so much for being with us this morning on Sunday edition. We want to continue our conversation on the Dignity Index. It's a pilot program being tested right here in Utah, hoping to increase dignity in public discourse, especially public messages from politicians. The eight point scale is designed to rate speech, not people in as unbiased a manner as is possible. And I'm here with Dr. Jesse Graham and Tammy Pfeiffer, and what a pleasure to have you here. We'd like to uh, maybe do a little uh, sample of this. We had our third district congressional debate the other night, and we thought we would play a little bit from each of the candidates. And one, uh, Jesse, I understand, was rated the lowest, and then the next set were rated the highest. So let's share those right now with our viewers of Sunday Edition. Here we go. It's about fairness. We have to be fair to these young women. I have four daughters. I do not want a man competing with them in sports, period, under any circumstances. Now, if it's more complicated than that, I'm happy to sit down and talk about it. But I don't see where there's a place for that. I think the really uh, bad part of that bill was it came from a, a segment of our society that is afraid of the LGBTQ community. And just, you know, they, they, they found transgender folks as the latest whipping person. 
that from both of the candidates in the third congressional district race. Let's get the science of this and the methodology. And I understand those two statements were ranked among the lowest moments in the debate. Yeah, but I should note both of those were, were rated right in the middle of the scale. Um, I was pretty amazed by the level of dignity in the debate overall. Uh, most of the examples we found were rated up at the top of the scale. Um, we had we had a, a seven and, and several sixes. Um, and so those those last two were rated uh, a five and a four, um, which is, is the middle of the scale. And so overall, I would say I was very surprised at, at how little contempt the candidates showed for each other. Um, they mostly talked about policies and they mm -hmm. talked about policy differences, but they didn't name call. Uh, they didn't refer to the other side as, as evil. Um, and those were those were a, a couple of examples where, where they were clearly disagreeing um, and weren't being particularly uh, offering a lot of dignity to the other side, but they also weren't being too extreme in their contempt either. Right, as yeah. I listened to both of those cuts, I thought, well, that, you know, compared to some stuff right. yeah. we have heard, uh, and not just nationally, but even here in the state of Utah, we've had some pretty wild and woolly uh, debates over the last little while, and particularly in advertising, and that's kind of a mm -hmm. different animal, I understand. How about if we uh, take a look at several of the uh, comments, or at least one comment from each of the candidates that got a higher rating? Let's do that now. But I, I get a unique perspective uh, where I sit, and, and I, would, I would bring up two things. First of all, we've been in bad places before as a country. I think about, of course, the Civil War, Watergate, um, the assassination of President Kennedy. And what's so great about this country is in every single one of those cases, we emerged a better country than before we went into that. And part of the seat that I get to sit at right now is to see the slice of Congress of Washington, D.C., that most of you rarely get to see on the cable news network or in social media. And I can tell you that there's hundreds of my colleagues on both the right and the left who wake up in the morning and say, I want to do what's best for this country. And they're not part of the divisiveness, and they're not part of the screaming and the shouting and the fighting. But they come together every day to work to see how we can advance uh, the, the, the will of this country. And so that gives me hope. And tonight, I, I hope all of you have hope in this great country. I think it's important not to uh, try to make a lot of cheap sound bites and call your opponents names and uh, belittle them. Well, what I've learned is that uh, I, I, I truly think most people, now there, there's some people who are never gonna agree with me on a lot of issues, but most people we can agree on what the problems are. And what we have to do is, you know, we may not agree on the solutions. And that's where we have to have a dialogue and, and figure out how to get things done. But you, you don't start that dialogue by calling somebody a, a, a nasty name. See, were those uh, comments pretty much the peak for each of the candidates during this debate? They were, uh, but, but again, we had a lot of examples like that where they were, they were really you know, up at the, at the higher end of the scale, um, showing an eagerness and a willingness to work with people on the other side, uh, showing respect for the other side, even if they disagree with them. Um, and again, you know, he, he's specifically talking about name calling and, and right. not showing contempt to the other side. So. Right. Tammy, your thoughts on this well, is... As you watched that last clip, think if we had a Congress full of people like that, that could talk to each other, that could actually solve problems. And part of the, the Dignity Index goal is to, to develop these types of relationships in disagreement to where we can solve problems. We ease, ease divisions, we solve problems. We prevent violence, ultimately, uh, from when we speak with dignity rather than contempt. This uh, dignity index and the buzz about it, the press releases that came out on it were just before this debate. Do you suspect that maybe there was a little, we better be on good behavior tonight because of the dignity <laughs> we index? We can only hope so. Uh, we'd, we'd take it if it was the case. If we're, right. if we're shaming candidates into being dignified with each other, all the better. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how the other debates go, including right. the Senate debates, mm -hmm. the debate that I'm going to be moderating before too long. And boy, that's a race that has a lot of focus. I mean, not just in Utah, but nationally, and the rather uniqueness of it. It's been called weird, it's been called uh, the most unique race that's going on in the country today. And we have a couple of uh, things that have been sent out via email. The first one is from Senator Mike Lee, and I'll uh, share it for those who maybe can't uh, read uh, their, their screen right now. This came out September 28th, quote, 
Democrats have figured out a way to make this race for Utah's Senate seat competitive by supporting a fake independent who will, in reality, vote with them. Unfortunately, many are falling for it, and he's raising more than we anticipated through a system that otherwise supports only Democrat candidates. The left is funding my opponent's campaign. Then there's this one from Evan McMullen that was sent out from his campaign on September 5th. My, this is the quote. My name is Evan McMullen. I'm running for U.S. Senate in Utah to replace obstructionist Senator Mike Lee, and I'm asking for your support. Let's just kind of slice and dice this. Have they been rated on the Dignity Index? Yeah, and, and to be clear, it's, it's not Tammy and I rating them. We've, we've, we've trained a group of ideologically diverse coders, um, and so we have groups of, of three coders, all of which contain uh, liberals and conservatives kind of working right. together because we all have our political biases and we know um, that that can, that can enter into this. And so in, in the training, what was really uh, heartening to see is that we could get a lot of agreement across this broad ideological spectrum of people coding Quoting these texts, so the, the first thing we want to know is, you know, can we get ground truth here? Can we get these texts coded? In terms of those last two examples, the, the coders all came to consensus and, and gave them both a four on right. the scale, which is kind of the start of contempt. Right. That's kind of the first level of contempt. Right. It's certainly not the worst, but it's you know, there's some name calling there. Uh, you're suggesting that the other candidate is is. Um, uh, not truthful, is is maybe right. incompetent, things like that. As you get lower on the scale, you get more contempt. So a three would be my opponent is evil. A two becomes it's not just me versus them, it's me or them. Um, they're an existential threat. And then right. a one is it is our moral duty to destroy them. So We are sadly out of time, but I want, we've got about 30 seconds is all. Okay. The future of the index, how much hope is there for this? I think there is a lot of hope, Doug. And as you have seen in the media you, recently, a lot of people are very interested in this. We have a website, dignityindex.us, where people can go to learn more about the, the scores. What is a four? What is a seven? Right. Uh, we have that on the index. We also have had a lot of... Uh, uh, interest expressed by business uh, and corporate uh, mm -hmm. partners who say, I actually want to join. I'm going to take a pledge yeah. and I want to be a dignity ambassador. And so we have a pledge on our website that people can take. We're working with business groups now and I think the future is very bright. We're going to keep a real close eye on this. Thank you so much for joining us and every week we're going to look into the index and see what it's telling us. Thank you for joining us this for this episode of Sunday Edition. We hope you'll join us back here next week. And Music and the Spoken Word is coming up next.